Okay, well, welcome everyone to tonight's virtual program, Out of the Closet and Into Comics. Uh, I'm Nicole, I'm the Adult Services Supervisor here at Rocky River Public Library, and we're very excited to have Valentino Zulo here. Um, we have been trying to get him here for over a year, but this darn pandemic has been uh, causing us some issues. So finally, we've got him here um, talking about one of my favorite topics, comics and their role in important issues. Um, so tonight we're gonna to be diving into the history of um, the LGBTQIA plus community in comics, but a little bit about our speaker before we pass it off to him. Valentino Zulo is a comic scholar uh, and a psychotherapist with a PhD in English from Kent State University and a master of science in social administration from Case Western Reserve University. He's currently the Ohio Center for the Book Scholar in Residence at Cleveland Public Library, and he co-leads the Get Graphic program there, fantastic programs. In addition, he is a maternal depression therapist at Ohio Guidestone, an instructor at Cleveland Institute of Art, and American editor of the Journal of Graphic Novels and Comics. And um, this is, I stole this from your website, but I love it. Uh, Valentino believes in literature, social justice, and the superhero way. <laughs> Thank you. I forgot I wrote that. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> so with that, I will pass the mic to you. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Nicole. Thank you for inviting me. I'm excited to, to be here finally. Yeah. So like as, as Nicole said, we uh, we planned this a long time ago when the pandemic happened uh, or still happening, but started. Um, and I thought I can't do a Zoom talk. I've never done a Zoom talk. Now I've done so many Zoom talks. So um, I'm, I'm used to it now, but um, definitely at first I was like, I, I can't do that. So, all right, I'm gonna get started. Um, if there are noises behind me, it's because there are there is a dog and a cat that are playing and they may appear on screen. There are three cats and a dog, so at any point an animal may appear on screen. <laughs> so just FYI, none may appear, all may appear, I don't know. <laughs> sometimes they appear, sometimes they don't. All right, I'm gonna, I am going to share my screen. This is always like, I know I do this all the time, and yet every time it's it's a, it's a big thing. Play from current slide. Okay. All right. So I'm going to um, share with you a history of queer comics. Um, I say um, I say a history of queer, queer comics because obviously I'm not doing it all, and sort of this is my my sort of my my interpretation of queer, queer comics. Um, I like to always say when I do talks on comics that I was like, I probably won't talk about your favorite character. I probably won't talk about your favorite comic. Um, and I probably don't, and then most of the time I don't even talk about mine. Um, but I'm going to tell you a story about queer comics. And um, and with that, like I said, I'm not talking about a lot of things. Um, and you have to also remember that probably every image that I show represents the 10,000 that I'm not able to show. Um, but I try and say that because inevitably <laughs> someone will say, well, what about like Deadpool? And so I was like, now we're talking about Deadpool. Deadpool comes up a lot. So I've, said, I've mentioned Deadpool. Um, he's good now. <laughs> um, but so um, I'm going to, yeah, I'm going to tell this, this story of queer comics um, and we'll see where it goes and feel free to ask questions in the middle of it. Um, if you, if there's something you want me to elaborate upon, if you have a thought, um, feel free to ask. Um, I will at, at in at points sort of pause and say like are you are you with me? Um, so and then we'll go. All right. So um, when we talk about queerness in comics, um, I mean the early years queerness wasn't yet an established category, so we have to sort of go back and find it in comics. Um, it usually appears in these sort of um, these moments of generally cross-dressing. One example is the Madame, is the character Madame Fatale from, from Crack Comics, which is a golden age comic series um, by Richard Stanton. Well, no, sorry, the character is Richard Stanton, sorry. <laughs> um, and so the character of the character here, Matt, Richard Stanton plays, becomes the, the superhero sort of figure, um, Madame Fatale. Um, also, we see the queerness in the, the Red Tornado, Ma Hunkel, who dresses up as a superhero, and people people think that Ma Hunkel is 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 a male character. Um, or we see it sort of in like funny examples, quote unquote funny examples, with like Jimmy Olsen uh, doing 
the, there was an issue of Superman's pal Jimmy Olsen where he was dressed up as a woman. Um, and so <laughs> this is sort of a funny little issue. Um, there's other examples, but usually it's queerness appears as um, sort of cross-dressing or sort of like funny moments that are not that um, are not meant to be, that we don't yet know of, we don't really think of the yet as queer. Of course, queerness existed. I mean, being a queer person, I know that, that it existed before this time. <clears throat> but in the early golden age and even into the silver age, which would be the Jimmy Olsen series, um, it's not really represented as an identity category. It's sort of just a, 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 a transgressive moment. And it, they wouldn't even be sort of thought of as trans transgressive, but when we go back, we see these moments that are sort of funny um, and or or intriguing that you have a character like Ma Uncle who's, who's dressing up as the Red Tornado or you have um, Madame Fatale. But it's not yet an identity category. Um, for comics, especially for mainstream comics, it's not yet presented as an identity category. Um, it that sort of coalesces in this particular moment um, where there is sort of this, there is a moment where we sort of think of queerness becoming an identity category, particularly um, with the representation of homosexuality. And I say that I, I say I use the term homosexuality because that's what um, what would have been used by Frederick Wortham. I I will use gay and queer and. And, and other terms um, later, but in um, in this period where we're in, so we're we're in the golden age of comics. Um, it, I mean, we're thinking of we're using terms like homosexuality um, to give you, and then to give you a bit of background on what this is. So, while queerness existed as sort of a playful thing, like I said, it's sort of funny, it's sort of playful, it's there, it's not yet an identity category, it's not yet seen as as something that is of concern. And many times, even after this point, it won't be in the golden age. But um, in 1954, a famous, in a famous American psychiatrist, Frederick Wortham, wrote a book called *The Seduction of the Innocent*. And um, he, and in his book, he takes on many aspects of the comic book industry. He really goes after comics. Um, and one of the things he does take on is the representation of, of characters being gay, or as he claims them to be gay in the. Um, in, in the comics. And in particular, he goes after, um, he goes after Batman and Robin. He uses like scenes like this to depict, uh, to suggest that Batman and Robin are in a, in a, in a gay relationship. As he says, um, the Batman and Robin characters represent homosexual wish fulfillment. Um, he, after, he also goes after characters um, like Wonder Woman. Um, he says that she that she um, she's, she's a lesbian character. Um, though interestingly, um, Carol Tilly, I can give you the reference for this article if you're interested. Um, I edit, I co-edit the um, the journal of graphic novels and comics, and Carol Tilly published an article for us um, on Hilda Moss, who was one of Wortham, Wortham's um, fellow psychiatrists, that actually was particularly against Wonder Woman. And she, it's actually her writings on Wonder Woman that he inserts into his book. In early drafts of his writing, he has no concern about Wonder Woman. In fact, but it's but it's Hilda Moss's influence that leads him to actually include the writings on Wonder Woman, almost word for word from her writing. Um, but in particular, um, he goes after the comics. And mind you, this is 1954. This is the heyday of the Red Scare. And this is, you know, the fear of linking communism to homosexuality. And, you know, it's that old playbook. Um, and so he goes after these characters saying that they're influencing kids. And this wasn't his main concern in the book. His main, he had three main concerns when he wrote Seduction of the Innocent. And I won't spend whole time on it, though I can. I really, I'm really interested in Frederick Wortham being a psychotherapist myself. Um, he... He goes after comics because he says that they are, he doesn't like that they're mass produced. Um, he doesn't like that they ha lack literary and artistic merit. And he doesn't like that they, they promote, as he says, um, promote sexual sex, sex and violence. And sort of that's where homosexuality, the concern over homosexuality comes in. And he's very worried that these characters um, will, will influence um, boys and girls. And he even refers to Wonder Woman at one point as a morbid ideal. Um, so she's very scary for him. Um, and so as it, and so, <clears throat> as I said, prior to this moment, the queerness exists in, in different ways and we go back and I think there's, very, there's a lot of queerness in Wonder Woman, Wonder Woman comics in particular that we can definitely go back and find. But his concern led to a Senate subcommittee hearing in 1954. So what's important about his book is that in 1954, 
it, not just his book, but without getting into the whole story of the anti-comics crusades, which I'm, which I'm happy to talk about more in the Q&A, which I love to talk about. Um, there was about a four, 14, 15 year buildup in the, what's called the anti-comics crusades that led up to the publication of his book, which led to the Senate subcommittee hearings on juvenile delinquency in 1954 um, that, led, that, in, that inevitably um, led to the establishment of the Comics Code Authority. Oh, here's a um, here's an example. Um, this is um, because of the the anti comics crusade. People were burning comics. Your seduction of the innocent. One of the most infamous lines um, from Wortham's um, testimony was, "I think Hitler was a beginner compared to the comic book industry." Um, I like that. I like to picking that line out. It's sort of out of context, and everybody likes to pull it out of context and show how how insane he was. And I don't think he was, he was, what he says afterwards is he says that they, um, that the, the comic books get to kids earlier than Hitler. It's quite the overstatement to make, but still it's, he, he what he, he's using as a metaphor though, in 1954, nine years after the end of World War II, it's quite a statement to make nonetheless. So I like, I like showing it. He was just to show his, just his anxiety about comics and, and the influence they were having on children. Um, again, I can go into this, but the, the reason why a psychiatrist is even this invested in, in comics is because the, the, the role of mental health in the early 20th century was defined by what was called mental hygiene. It had yet to become as many referred to mental health as Freudianized, meaning it was so individualized after the war, but it was so focused on public health. Mental health was a public health concern. And so comics were a public health concern, a mental health concern for Wortham, which I can go into later. That's, it's something I'm, I'm particularly interested in. Um, but so what was important about Wortham is that the, his testimony among many others, he's only one, but he sort of becomes emblematic of the entire anti-comics crusades because his book is so important because he testifies at the, at the hearings along with others, but he's sort of remembered the most. And he, he sort of serves, serves as a good emblem of the entire movement of the anti-comics movement. But what happens is the comics companies in an effort to avoid government regulation um, well, I'll take that for a second before you all read it. Um, to, in order to avoid government regulation, the comics companies voluntarily create what's called the Comics Code Authority. And they create this um, Comics Code Authority, which is a group that they submit their comics to, which the comics companies submit their comics to, that review the comics so that they are, that they're okay, that they fulfill certain requirements that, um, and there were a lot of them. One of them is, and for our purposes today, one of them is, you know, making sure that there's no sexually sexual implications, meaning of any gay representation or any concern that there there can even be that can even be implied. And um, so the, that Comics Code Authority gets established, and it leads to a massive just like. Um, change of, of the whole industry. Be, um, but they did this because they were worried, the, many of the comic book companies were sort of concerned that there would be government oversight. And it's not unheard of to imagine, I mean, it wouldn't be unimaginable, I shouldn't say unheard of, not unimaginable. Um, in, I believe it was 1949, the New York State Assembly, if I remember, it wasn't the Senate, I think it was the State Assembly, um, though I can get you this information exactly. Um, but anyway, um, one of the two houses of, of the New York Congress had, um, did, was um, trying to pass, were trying to pass laws to um, uh, regulate comics. And typically the regulation that was being sort of circulated or talked about was banning comics for children under 15 or 16 years of age. And that, that there's sort of variation between whether it be 15 or 16. Um, so it wasn't unheard of. So in order to avoid the government getting involved, the comic book companies decided to create the Comics Code Authority themselves. They did, in fact, ask Wortham to head the Comics Code Authority, which they thought would have been a, a major coup to have him actually head the authority. He wanted to have nothing to do with it. He was, Wortham himself was very angry that the, um, that the government didn't get involved. And so Anyway, that's a that's a story for uh, I can that's a that's a whole other talk. But um, just to give you some context, um, Worth Wortham's sort of attack on comics solidified many things, including the fact that now queerness was sort of in focus. Before it hadn't been, it could be there, and it was not of concern. Now there was a there was a laser focus on many things, including representation of sexuality. Um, <clears throat> so. The Comics Code Authority outlines many, many things, including these, these points, which are important for us for the purpose of the discussion of um, sexuality 
and gender in comics. And so um, the Comics Code Authority says that illicit sex relations are neither to be hinted at or portrayed, violent love scenes as well as sexual abnormalities, so there, there's our homosexuality, are unacceptable. The treatment of love romance stories shall emphasize the value of home and the sanctity of marriage. So heteronormativity had to be had to be pushed um, onto everybody, and sex perversion or any inference to the same is strictly forbidden. Um, I wouldn't say that any of this was was there in any in any way that was particularly influential on on children. Like reading back, there's queerness in Wonder Woman, but I mean, I wouldn't say that it's that it's like advocating for sexual abnormalities. Like if you go back and read the comics. However, Wortham's um, interpretations of the comics um, a lot really made made it so that they were they were sort of believed that there was some concern here, and in, especially with the characters of like Batman and Robin. So that all gets erased, and, and what happens is it doesn't just get rid of characters that are queer, but sort of but in explicit ways, but sort of characters that sort of fall in these gray areas too, like a character like Catwoman, who will come out as bisexual many years later around around 2000, uh, 2015. But in particular, um, the character of Catwoman gets taken out of Batman comics. She gets amnesia and becomes a florist for many years. She sort of gets taken out until, until she comes back in the Batman TV show years later. Um, but the erasure of queer characters, like I said, doesn't just get rid of explicitly queer characters. It gets rid of characters that are, that are in the gray area. So there's a sort of, um, concretization of, of, of identity categories and, and really a concretization of heterosexuality in comics at this time and, and um, gender roles that are very specific. Um, and so one of the ways that this sort of gets addressed um, is in, um, in 1956, um, DC Comics creates the character of Batwoman. And it's, it's just like an, I'll, we'll get back to Batwoman in 2006, um, but just pay attention to this because this is interesting. So you'll see even the way that like the, the gaze changes. So if you, um, let me see if I go back. So Batman and Robin are looking at each other here. Um, you'll see here that Bat Robin stops looking at, 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 I mean, sorry, Robin and Batman stop looking at each other. Robin can look at Batman because it's okay for a young child to look at an older adult male and sort of see them as inspiration, but they shouldn't look at each other. So Robin here is looking at Batman, Batman's looking at, at Batwoman. And you see this a lot in the images. This is that same issue of, um, of Detective Comics. And by the end of the issue, um, Batwoman is quote unquote, no longer a superhero, though she will continue to play a role in the Batman comics for um, about 10 more years. And then they just kill her off when they don't need her anymore. Um, but at the, by the end of the issue, um, Batwoman says that she's no longer, she's no longer a superhero. And you can see here, um, and later a new trophy is added to the Batcave. Um, and Batman says, yes, she gave me the portrait now that her, her career's over, exclamation point. I love that, her career's over, like it's done. 12 issues, I mean, sorry, 12 pages later, she's no longer a superhero. We have nothing to be concerned about. Um, I thought it'd be an er, interesting trophy. Um, I wonder if we'll ever fight crime with her as a dynamic trio. So you start to see a lot of this promotion of, of, of family um, and not in, any, not in any meaningful way, like Batwoman sort of just exists in the comics. Um, she's not particularly significant. Uh, Catherine, her name is Catherine Kane, by the way, I should give her a name other than Batwoman. Um, Catherine Kane is, um, she's not particularly significant. She has a role. She will appear a lot in the Batman family stories. There was a series, um, um, I think it was a quarterly series called Batman Family. She would appear a lot in there, but she served the purpose of saying that Batman and Robin were in fact not together, that, they're, that, that Batman is heterosexual. He's in love with Batwoman. They are a family together, and there'll even be a Batgirl character, not the one that we know of today, but there will be a um, Kathy's uh, Catherine Kane will have a will have a protege like Robin that will be that girl now sort of be like Robin's little implied girlfriend. Um, so <clears throat> the main so the mainstream comics sort of regulate any concerns about about homosexuality, any about, about sexual deviance, um, and they really promote homosexuality. Um, what's important though is so as the as the um, main, as the mainstream comics are dealing with the hysteria over homosexuality and, uh, and all that Wortham did. Like I said, there's a lot more, like this is a very, very focused 
um, one, like, I think one chapter of Wortham's book. It's a big book. He makes a lot of claims about comics. But I mean, this is one thing that had a great influence on um, mainstream comics. And so as mainstream comics were dealing with the fallout from Wortham and trying to regulate themselves in many, many different ways, including getting rid of horror, getting rid of crime, um, anything weird. And weird was like a word you couldn't use. Strange was a word you couldn't use anymore. Um, there were certain words that just got totally erased from the vocabulary of comics. Um, and as um, Wortham's influence just sort of changes the comic book industry, um, the many creators leave and many comic book companies go under. One, one um, namely one comic book company called EC Comics. So EC Entertaining Comics, um, it goes under. Um, they would, uh, well, they're, they would stop publishing their comics. They would then go on to publish um, Mad Magazine, but they would stop publishing comics by 1955. Um, and so one of the things that happens then uh, is the stories that were being told in a lot of these, all these comics that were sort of strange or weird or abnormal in some way, um, they stopped being told, but there were still many readers of the time that were interested in those types of stories. And a lot of them go over to magazines like Mad Magazine, which was not regulated like the comics, like comics were. Um, but what happens then is those readers grow up and about 10 years later, they start, they start drawing their own stories. So they're kids at this time and, and they start drawing their own stories and they start publishing them in, in underground comics or I mean underground newspapers. And these are people like Justin Green, who's, who's, um, who lives down in Cincinnati. He created, the, or Dayton, um, he, he created the first um, autobiographical comic in 1972. Um, people like Robert Crumb, um, people like Art Spiegelman, they're reading these comics at the time. Even Alison Bechtel will cite Mad, Mad Magazine and the EC Comics as influence. Um, and these are all these early creators and the, they were reading these and so, with the counterculture movement in the 1960s and the ability to print um, in your own homes or in or small press um, publications, um, a lot of those cartoonists that were reading those early EC comics and other sort of weird comics, um, they then went on to publish in underground newspapers. And so one of the major places they would publish in um, in 1965 was the Berkeley Barb was published. And this is a place where you see a lot of like Robert Crumb stuff, um, especially in the East Village other, um, which is another underground newspaper. And so both of them started in 1965 and they last into the night into about 1980, um, but they will start um, in 1965 and they're mostly um they're mostly comics that are responding to the counterculture movement most a lot of the the anti-war movement there's going to not be a lot of queer comics in these but there's going to be the beginnings of the, of the stories that would then influence the beginning of a lot of queer comics but importantly for us it's the establishment of um stories that were not mainstream anymore. They're not regulated by the Comics Code Authority. People can publish their own stuff in their basements now because they're just easier access to printing. They can publish their, they can publish small print runs that are not, that are not um, regulated by major companies. And so these sort of magazines, these newspapers are gonna be sold at head shops and other places um, just you know, on the street. And especially in these, in these major cities like, like the Bay Area or New York. Notably for us, um, you know, with, the, in the same movement would be something like the, the publication of The Advocate. And that is where you do start to see some early, some early gay comics, um, in particular more gay, gay comics, not, not yet queer, but really explicitly gay, um, if we make a distinction. Um, and I make that distinction just because, I mean, a lot of these artists are going to call themselves gay, right? This is going to be the beginning of the gay and lesbian movement. It's not going to be, uh, you know, we're not going to think of queer, queerness as a, as a, as a reclaimed term yet. Um, one, of the, um, one of the famous comics that was like a one panel comic that was often published in um, The Advocate was Miss Thing by Joe Johnson. Um, they're funny little strips. Um, they're not strips, they're just one panel. They're funny little one panel comics usually. And they're published in The Advocate. Um, and <clears throat> so you're seeing a lot of these stories published, a lot of little like single single panel comics, a few panel comics published in a lot of these newspapers. Um, by, by the by 1970s though, even earlier, but for our purposes, like by 1970, um, you're starting to see people that are publishing more like comic books. So a lot of those artists that were publishing just like one panels, especially like someone like Robert Crumb, are gonna start publishing things like Zap Comics. Crumb would publish Zap Comics. 
Um, what this leads to though, is a lot of the, a lot of these early comics artists um, are going to be men and they're gonna be straight men. And most of them are going to be drawing stories that are not relatable to other minority groups. Um, and so, um, you know, oh yeah, someone said, I love that cover. Yeah, I do love, I love that cover. Um, it's a great cover. It's by Trina, Trina Robbins. So this is 1970 and Trina Robbins publishes It Ain't, it Ain't Me Babe. And um, they sort of retell a bunch of, they take a lot of famous characters and um, like they redo the little Lulu story. And I can't remember who the guy, who the little boy is a little Lulu's always fighting with, but little Lulu even says in the comics, she's just like, just F it. Like she just gets mad at the end. And she says, just, just F it. Um, I don't know if we have any children here, so I'm not gonna, <laughs> I'm not gonna swear. Um, so, um, so anyway, so what happens though is there's a lot of the field is the field. It is a boys club. Part of the, um, it's hard to stress how how impactful this anti comics crusades were because prior to 1954, the field of comics was filled with minority writers and 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 just I mean it was filled with women creators and women cartoonists and women writers and and I mean just like tons of people that you wouldn't see. And after the anti-comics crusades and the co and consolidation of the comic book companies after the Comics Code Authority was established, it becomes a boys club. It becomes of what we know now as a boys club. Like when we call a comics a boys club, that is absolutely the fault of the, of the anti-comics crusaders, including Wortham. Um, there were plenty of other people that were doing that were doing work on um, creators of color. Um, we can't really. I, I, we, it's hard, it would hard to be hard to say there was a lot of queer creators because of the period, but there's a lot of people that are not men that are doing um, comics in the early period. But then with the consolidation of the comic book companies, um, because the Comics Code Authority um, definitely becomes a boys club. And that's true of the underground comics movement until Trina Robbins and the Women's Comics Collective come together, they publish it Ain't Me Babe, and then they start the series of, of women's comics. In, uh, in 1972. Um, and so importantly for us, this is the first time that um, a, a story is told with a, a, about a, a lesbian character and Trina Robbins tells the story of Sandy Comes Out. And Sandy, Sandy is, um, is Robert Crumb's sister and she tells the story of, like, of Sandy in, in her comic. And it's an important moment that we get, we get a story that's explicitly gay and lesbian well it's lesbian and it's and it's one of the first moments where we have an explicit reference to um queerness that's not sort of just that playful queerness of like that's presented in the earlier comics like now it's explicit it's an identity category and this is a direct response to the male dominated um stories that were coming out of the underground comics movement um and this is this is definitely the beginning of, of a lot of really explicit I mean, explicit in every in every sense of the word of, of gay comics, right? Explicit as in very focused, but also explicit as in we're going to get a lot of sex. Um, but I won't I won't show any of that, though. I can definitely direct you to funny comics um, that because again, like I can't see who's here, so I don't know if like anybody's with their family. Um, so um, well, I'll pause there. I, I usually stop at the Wortham stuff because I talk a lot about that. But um, do you all have any questions or comments? Should I keep going? I can't see you all, so hopefully, I'm, hopefully you're also with me. <laughs> uh, I don't see anything, so I'm gonna say, let's keep going. <laughs> okay, awesome. Okay, so um, the um, okay, so keep all right. So um, all right. So as I keep going, um, okay. <laughs> Thank you. We did um, get a question, Valentino, just now about um, to what extent was Anita Bryant involved in this movement? Uh, um, <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't know that Anita Bryant had much to say about comics, but it would be, I, I've never actually um, looked up to see if Anita Bryant had anything to say about comics. Um, I would love to know. I mean, Anita Bryant is infamous, right? The, um, um, but the, because of the pie um, in her face, but um, I don't, I wonder, I actually don't know if Anita Bryant had anything to say about comics. So at this, so I'll say this, that, um, I mean, I don't know, I'm going to, I'm going to speculate right now, um, but I would say that comics were such a big deal up until the 1950s, 
Um, Nita Bryant probably would have noticed them then. By the 1970s, they were under such regulation that I don't know, and that I don't know that Nita Bryant would have paid attention. That being said, um, these underground comics were not under regulation, but they're not really well known. I mean, the fact is that they were circulated amongst very special specialized groups. Um, she may have had comments about, say, The Advocate as a, as a publication, but I don't know. I wonder if she had anything to say about comics. So it's definitely something interesting to think about. Um, thank you, Kevin, for throwing me off. <laughs> um, what happened to them? I mean, um, they just didn't really publish them. It wasn't, I mean, after the, I mean, you weren't, you really, you couldn't publish them. Like they were, they were regulated. Um, they were, they were just regulated out of, um, of storytelling. It wouldn't be until the, until the underground comics movement that I'm talking about now that they would even be able to do that. Um, also, if we think about it historically, it wouldn't have been something that I think a lot of people would have, I wouldn't say want it. I don't want to say want, but it wouldn't have. It may not have been. There may not have been a space for it. Um, it wasn't until the publication of Sandy comes out in the U.S. at least that people even consider publishing stories about about queerness again. Um, they're really just not told. And like I said, like in the sense that there, the Comics Code Authority would have, if they would have read something where that was that was um, had any representation of queerness, they would have said we can't publish this. Um, and the comics companies were so afraid that they wouldn't have gone against the Comics Code Authority. It isn't for many years, and it's a famous um, Spider-Man comic, and I, I don't remember right now which one it is. Um, I'm blanking on it, but there's a comic where Spider-Man is dealing with a drug with with um, people doing drugs, and the Comics Code Authority even refuses to put a stamp on that. And Marvel like bucked the Comics Code Authority in, in that month in particular, um, and said we're going to publish this story anyway. But it, but that would be later. That's in and that would be um, way later than, than the early the early years of the Comics Code Authority. The comics companies were so afraid they were not going to they were not going to press the Comics Code Authority. Um, there was such a fear that, like EC Comics, any comics company could go under. EC was probably the most popular comics comics company um, in the in the early 1950s. They were the trendsetter. They they set the trends for everything, and then they're all and then they're gone. And we don't even most people don't even know who they are, but they were huge. I mean. Comics, you also, I, I'll just back up for a second. This was a big deal because comics were, were the main medium for children up until the, the, the advent of the, the television. Many comics, many comic books would, would, uh, would um, advertise 6 million readers sometimes, which is absolutely like amazing. Like now, today, if a comic sells 100,000 copies, that's a big deal. Now, they would advertise 6 million readers. That didn't mean they sold 6 million copies. Because of the nature of comics and their circulation, a comic book could sell 1 million copies. And then they would say that six, they, that, that comic circulated through six different hands. So they would often ad, ad, like advertise um, 6 million copies. Um, that's 6 million readers, not copies. Um, but as I said, all of that changed with the Comics Code Authority. Now there's other things that were going on too. Like I said, the advent of the television sort of affected that as well, but um, the, the, the comics reading. But, but in particular, if, if someone were to wanna do something, Marvel or DC or, or Dell or some of these other comic, comic companies, they wouldn't, they wouldn't do it. I mean, I don't know, we might, if there's some stories in the archive, I think they could be like they're hidden away somewhere. Um, but I think probably some people have stories about that, but they wouldn't, there would be no way that Marvel or DC would even try to, to do something. You'll see, we'll get to a point in the story where the, where the um, Comics Code Authority will relax some of the restrictions and then we'll start to get that, but not at this point. Um, okay, so I'll get that. Um, but thank you for the questions. Um, I hope that clarifies things. A lot of that was speculation because I don't have particular answers, but I hope sort of this speculation based on what I know sort of helps. Um, like I said, there could be stories out there that are hidden, but nothing that we know. Um, I was gonna say this at the end, but there's a documentary that's coming out that's been shown at some film festivals called No Straight Lines. Um, that if you're interested in this, No Straight Lines is a, it, it should be coming out soon. There was a Kickstarter for it years ago that I um, submitted to and there, the Guardian did a big review of No Straight Lines, but it's been um, at a few film festivals and got a good reviews. And um, No Straight Lines is a it's a history of queer comics that hopefully will illuminate some of the stuff that we don't know. I, um, 
again, because we weren't, I think because a lot of people weren't, especially in the early period before the 19, before the lesbian and gay movement, there wasn't a sense of, of there wasn't an explicit focus on these, on these categories as identity categories. So there could be a lot that's lost, that's sort of just hidden in, that sort of is not named in certain ways. And the way when we go back to like pre-modern or early modern texts, homosexuality or, or, or gender identities that are, that are, um, that are non-normative, I guess, um, are not named in the way that we would name them today. Um, yeah, so well, there's in the chat. Were lesbian stories better received by the public or gay? Huh. Um, I guess it depends on how we define the public. A lot of these comics are not gonna be circulated amongst a vast public. Um, so they're circulating amongst a small group of people and they're very, and these, these cartoonists are very well received at the time. I'll show you some in, in, in a second. Um, but I guess I don't know that even a lot of pub, a lot of the public even knows about these. It's sort of like, I mean, I, I remember even 15 years ago, it's sort of like, I don't think that most of the public, like I remember the Gay People's Chronicle, right? That I don't think that even exists in the, in around anymore, but I remember it like, I don't think the public, a lot of public members knew about that, right? Like certainly my parents wouldn't have known about that newspaper, I knew about it. So it's hard to say that the public really read these. Um, it was a very specialized, I mean, the, the underground newspapers were so specialized and then the underground comics were even more specialized. Um, that they were circulating amongst a very small group of people. Um, but I think they were they were well regarded and they were kept. Um, but so um, I'll keep going and hopefully this will answer some of the questions. Um, so as I was saying, so 1972, um, Trina Robbins writes, Sandy comes out. One queer cartoonist in particular responds to this and she sort of finds herself concerned with um, Trina's story. Um, Mary Wings in particular, she says, in those days of identity politics, this is her response to, treat, to Sandy comes out. In those days of identity politics, only a lesbian could really tell the story of coming out. So I hastened to do a rejoinder to Trina's story. It was as if Sandy came out, went to the bar, took karate lessons, and that was it. There was an emotional and spiritual side to coming out that wasn't there. So Mary Wings in 1973 publishes Come Out Comics. Um, so Mary Wings and Trina Robbins are friends now and they joke about that moment, but Mary Wings was very, very incensed by Trina's telling a story of, um, of, a, of, a, of a lesbian uh, character that, that, that Mary Wings thought that she had no right to tell. Um, Sandy did give her permission, but Mary Wings was like, that, I don't want you to do that. Um, that then leads to many other publications like the series uh, Gay Comics in 1980 published by uh, Howard. I used to have that comic. Cool. I want. I want a copy of it. <laughs> um, um, Howard Cruz, Dennis Kitchen um, publishes uh, gay comics. It was edited by Howard Cruz. Um, it's. A, I, I love this cover. I, I. I have a copy of this one. I did. I did track this one down. Um, and whoops. I'll, I'll go back a second. Um, and Howard Cruz says in the opening. He says in drawing this book. We gay cartoonists would like to affirm that we are here and that we live lives as strewn with India inked craft balls, flawed heroics, quizzical word balloons, and surreptitious truths as the rest of the human race and even a few talking animals. <laughs> I always love that, that addition of the even a few talking animals. I think that's great. Um, and so what happens like the response by the Women's Co Comics Collective in 1972 to the underground comics that were dominated by men um, the queer cartoonists start to tell their own stories. Um, and so you sort of have a lot of this, especially in the early years, you sort of have a, like a, a, a bunch of stories that come out, a response to them, and then another, and then another response. And so, like I said, you have these sort of men writing comics, then the women's, then the women are like, hey, no, we want to tell our stories. And so that's people like, um, I mean, Trina Robbins, Aline kaminsky Crum later Carol Tyler and others that are responding to that early movement and they want to tell their own stories because they're feeling they're not represented. Then you'll have people then tell their own stories in, um, in places like come out comics or gay comics. Um, in that same year, 
Um, so these are comics that are circulating underground. Um, by underground, they're meaning they're like at head shops. They're like in. Um, they're not going to be at the Revco. They're not going to be at the at the local um, comic shops typically. Maybe in San Francisco, but they're typically not. They're going to be in um, you know same places. You're going to you're going to buy like um, rock and roll posters, for example, um, but not mainstream ones. And so a lot of this stuff is coming out of the Bay Area. It's coming out of New York. And um, in fact, in San Francisco, I mean, that was a major place for the, a lot of the comics community was there. And it wasn't so, so much like, oh, they're all getting together and drawing comics, but they were getting together and share, they would share comics with one another. They would get together at like different parties. Like Carol Tyler will tell stories about, you know, it wasn't like a community, like they were all sitting in a room and, and, and drawing comics together but they would see each other at parties. They would party together, they would hang out together, they would go and do their comics and they would share them with one another. They would publish them in these anthologies. They would call one another up and say like, hey, I need a three page comic. Can you do a three, I need a three page comic. Can you publish one for me? Um, like Carol Tyler, who tells a story about um, Aline Kaminsky Crumb calling her and saying, you know, I need a three page issue. I, I'm sorry, I need a three page story. Um, this is just an example of a story from Howard Cruz's um, Billy Comes Out, which was published in, um, in 1980 in, in Gay Comics. I just picked a, I picked a panel. There's some funny panels. Um, I won't say what happens and there are some funny panels though, but just for, to keep it PG, there are some, um, but look up Billy Comes Out, it's a funny story. Um, so at the same time, to go back to mainstream comics, um, hold on, I got a question. <laughs> I think it's a question. Yeah. So okay. Um, so yeah, Susan. Um, like you make a good point. Like they're in they're in um, like gay bookstores. Like there's a lot of famous like gay bookstores or or women's women led bookstores. Like you could find those in places like that, right? There's a very famous and I'm forgetting which one it was, but Bechdel bases, um, Alison Bechdel bases um, a bookstore in her comic in in off of a women's led bookstore in Minneapolis, I believe. Um, and so you can get them in places like that. So like, again, like I was saying, they're sort of specialized. You're not gonna get these comics in like mainstream like comic shops or like growing up, like I remember getting comics at Revco when before it was CBS, right? Like you're not gonna get those comics there. Um, they're not sort of heavily circulated. There's so few in existence. Um, and yeah, you're gonna get them in places like, like a, like a, um, Sort of like an underground, an underground bookstore, or like an independent bookshop of some sort. Like I could imagine some of these comics being sold like a Max Bax. Um, I, at least I can imagine that at some, like having been, you know, selling them there. Okay. Um, so in 1980, the same year, um, while queerness is being, while gay and lesbian identity is being explored in these other comics, um, Marvel publishes a famous comic called, which is issue 23 of a, of a series called Rampaging Hulk. And it's a story of an, of an, of a, of an attack on um, Bruce Banner, the Hulk, by these two effem, effeminate men. They're never called gay, but it's pretty clear. In the, and there's a sort of a, of a implied sexual assault that doesn't actually happen, but an attempt, I should say, an attempt at a sexual assault. Jim Shooter writes this series, and to this day, he's been asked to apologize or at least recant on the story, and to this day, he's never done it. Um, Jim Shooter was editor-in-chief at one point. It's a big, he's a, he's a big deal figure in the comics history, but in 1980, he did do the story, and he won't, um, and people have asked him to respond to doing the story in 1980, and he says no. Um, he won't take it back. Um, at least that was that was the the last time somebody asked him. Maybe he'll change his mind now. But um, it, there was a moment where where there's sort of an um, and a sexual assault that never comes that never happens with the Hulk, and um, it's a very disturbing comic. But this is what's going on in mainstream comics at the same time that that underground comics are exploring um, sexuality in really interesting ways and really giving. Um, really leaning into the categories of these new, of these now named identities um, that people are, are claiming and sort of exploring. And again, I sort of, as I say, I use lesbian and gay at this point, because at this point, we're going to think of it as lesbian and gay. We're not going to have a lot more language that's going to be used in these comics. Um, more chat. 
Yeah, he should apologize. He doesn't want to, apparently. Um, last I checked, maybe he has since, but no. Um, but so in underground comics, things are still going well at this time. Um, you can, uh, Howard Cruz is publishing the Wendell series. Um, and in 1983, um, Alison Bechtel will, will, will publish her famous comic strip, um, Dykes to Watch Out For. Uh, which famously comes, which which what famously comes from that. I'll go back to her quotation in a second. Is her uh, Bechtel rule, which probably most of you know, which is always a fun. Well, it's not fun; it's sad, but it's a it's a good strip to point out. Um, if you haven't read this strip, um, it's where the Bechtel rule comes from, and her rule. As I'll read the strip, and you'll see what her rule is. So her two characters are walking, and they one says to the other, "I want to see a movie and get popcorn." And the one says, well, I don't know, I have this rule, see, I only go to, move, to a movie if it satisfies three basic requirements. One, it has to have at least two women in it who, two, talk to each other about three, something besides a man. And then the one's thinking, and she says, pretty strict, but a good idea. No kidding, last movie I was able to see was Alien. The two women in it, in it talk to each other about the monster. Then they're depressed. I wanna go to my house and make popcorn? Now you're talking. So um, despite Be Bechtel doing this, um, it, to this day, there are not many movies where there are women in it who talk to each other about something other than a man, pretty, which is pretty sad. Um, and so, but it's still, it's, it, it's probably the most famous strip that comes out of um, Dykes to Watch Out For. And Bechtel did say when she, she says in an interview about, about her series, she said, what she's writing and she's, she says, I had set out to make lesbians visible. And that really is sort of the focus of this period. So in the early era that we're talking about the golden age of comics, which is 1938 to 1954, um, 1954 being the end point with the publication of Seduction of the Innocent, um, but 1938 to 1954, queerness isn't a, an identity category. It's sort of just an expression that's there. Like I said, like, you know, you have cross-dressing, but there's not a laser focus on it after Wortham, there's going to be a laser focus on it and it's going to be eradicated from comics. By the time we get to the 70s, people like Mary Wings are, are telling stories about like queer, about being gay, being lesbian. Mary Wings, Howard Cruz and others. And, and Alison Bechtel wants to tell her story. She said, I had set out to make lesbians visible. If you're interested in her story, um, like I said, No Straight Lines just came out, but also she details a lot of her experience across her many works, including Are You My Mother, where she talks about, where she's talking to her mother about starting this, this comic strip and how her mother was very concerned. Like, she's like, I, she's like, you can create these comics, but don't use your real name. And she's like, I want to use my real name. She's like, I want it. I want people to know who I am. Um, this was a, this is one of the most famous of the strips. Um, and the series wasn't published in, in like floppy comics. They were collected in, in, in book collections, but her works, her comics were published in a lot of newspapers, specifically lesbian and gay newspapers. For many years, she wrote, um, she wrote the series from 1983 to 2008. Um, and a couple of years ago, she did a couple follow-up strips. Um, after the election of Trump, she went back to the characters. She felt like she, she was sort of done with the characters after 2008. She went and back and did a couple stories of them in 2000, late 2016, early 2017. She sort of felt like she needed to go back to those characters. Um, oh, so, um, hold on, Q and A. <laughs> yeah, hypocrisy much, yeah. It was, okay, it was, it was approved. Um, so one of the reasons why it was approved is it wasn't considered a comic because it was Rampaging Hulk. It was actually considered like a magazine. Um, and so there's different, without getting into all the regulations, it was actually like not the main Hulk series, which is called Incredible Hulk. So there was, there was ways that they, they got around it for that particular story. And, and um, because it was a negative story, I think uh, Shooter was allowed to, to publish it. He was also editor in chief, so I guess he could do whatever he wanted. Um, so though in, so that's what's going on in the underground. So I'm going to go back and forth between the two now um, because the two will sort of coalesce eventually. But so you'll have these sort of two timelines going on right now. So in underground comics, you're having really interesting exploration with like Alison Bechtel and Howard Cruz and people like that. And then um, in mainstream comics, you have sort of the, 
uh, sort of silly representation of queer characters. Usually they're villainous, um, well, not always villainous, but sort of villain, sort of with like Disney characters, sort of even if they're not queer, the sort of queer elements of characters sort of get associated with villains. Um, Extraño is one character that does that, that is gay in the 1980s in, in DC comics, and he's sort of a silly character, silly villain. Um, um, though, on the other hand, like I said, really interesting stuff was going on. And Trina Robbins, who published the women who published It Ain't Me Babe in 1972, in the late 1980s, she publishes a comic called Strip AIDS USA to respond to the the, the AIDS um, epi epidemic at the time, and. Um, Robert Triptow publishes it with her, and he does say in the book, um, you can't get AIDS from reading this book. Instead, it could be part of a cure for hysteria, the other AIDS epidemic. So these comics were immediately responding, especially the underground comics, were immediately responding to whatever political, to political concerns at the time. And they published, and like one of the, like I said, they published this anthology, Strip AIDS USA, which is meant to raise money to, to fight AIDS. I realize it's 7.54, I keep answering questions and, okay, I'll, I'm gonna run through, um, hopefully I can take a few extra minutes. Um, um, so I'll run through the rest of this, I am taking too long. Um, in 1989, the Comics Code Authority revises its standards, but this time requires that social groups such as homosexuals must be portrayed in a positive light and that derogatory references to sexual orientation are forbidden unless used for dramatic purposes, <laughs> of course. Uh, you know, for dramatic purposes, right? So then things do change in mainstream comics, which is amazing, 1989. Um, and so, um, um, and so 1989, they, um, they allow for, they change it up. Um, you get characters in, in even like in, in flash com in, in the flash series who, you get a you get a main a villain who comes out as gay, um, and most most significantly, there's an issue of Alpha Flight in the early '90s, um, where North Star, who is a gay who is a gay um, mutant character, does come out as gay, and it's, it's considered the first mainstream superhero that comes out as gay, and he will be the first one that is like gets married to a man in in mainstream comics. Um, in in Incredible Hulk, um, Jim Wilson. Is a care, is a friend of the Hulk who who ends up being diagnosed with HIV, um, and Peter David writes the series, so it's not Jim Shooter, unfortunately, but it is um, it is Peter David. So he tells the story of the character diagnosed with HIV. So you do start to see sort of representation, like after the 1989 revision of the Comics Code, that it's okay to start telling stories about queer characters. Um, in the underground comics, you sort of you get a lot of new comics that they're less interested in in declaring um, gay identities and more sort of like now exploring them in different ways. Boy Trouble's a famous, a famous comic by Robert Kirby. Um, he says, a lot of people who did their own zines had the same little epiphany that I did, encountering a homemade alternative publication that created an instant frisson, a sense of new creative possibility. So he's sort of exploring different senses of gay identity, like the way the Bechdel would. Um, Diane DeMassa famously does Hothead Paisan, Homicidal Lesbian Terrorist. So less about, it's a funny series, you should check it out. Um, less about declaring gay identity and lesbian identity and queer identities and more about sort of just exploring the, the variations of it. Because after the 1980s, it wasn't, you didn't, there was enough comics that had, had shared those stories, especially in the underground, that there was less concern about um, making it known and more about sort of exploring it. Whereas mainstream comics were still trying to get there saying like, hey, queer characters exist like North Star, HIV is a concern, um, like with like in the Hulk comic. Um, one of the famous series of the 90s is Strangers in Paradise, tons of queer characters in there. Um, in <clears throat> over at, at um, DC Comics, they publish, they have an imprint and um, they have a series called they, they have a series called Stormwatch. They have a character's store, um, Midnighter and Apollo, who are sort of an alternate version of Batman and Superman who are in a relationship. The Midnighter series by Steve Orlando is really fun if you want to read that. Um, and then you sort of get like every once in a while you get characters that will lead their own series that are queer. In the early 2000s, Mystique was openly queer in her comics. She talks about it. It's a very, it's a very interesting series. Um, it's not always great. It's, it was fun. And as like a queer kid, like it was really fun to read. It's not, like I said, it's not great. One of my friends, 
Well, um, oh, um, well, he wrote Iceman. Um, Cena Grace, who wrote Iceman. I was like one of my friends. Yeah. So he wrote Iceman. I told him you should read the Mystique series. I said, I read this kid and he hadn't. And he said, um, he texted me and he was like, he's like, it's like a straight man writing about bisexuality. And I was like, yeah, but I was like, but it was important in 2008 <laughs> um, for me. And that's, it was 2004, actually, not 2008. Um, anyway, um, 2006, um, Bechdel famously published, published his Fun Home, which was sort of like a watershed moment for tons of new books and stories that were led by queer characters. Um, her, her, it's a coming out story, but it was like, I mean, it really made the, the um, queer comics mainstream at that point. Um, and Bechdel notably says what's interesting, like at this point, she says, when I started out my comics were lesbian comics, then they started being seen as comics. Um, I know I'm going through this fast, but I sort of want to wrap up a few things and then we can talk. Um, so at the, around 2008, um, we sort of start to see what becomes notable is like you have more consolidation and more um, and sort of queerness becomes more mainstream in comics. In particular, um, Batwoman is a new Batwoman character is created by Greg Rucka and J.H. Williams. And she leads, she leads um, the main Batman series called Detective Comics. So if you remember before, the old Batwoman, Catherine Kane, was you know there to stifle any 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 fear of homosexuality between Batman and Robin. Here now, Catherine Kate Kane, a new character, leads the Batman series. She's a great character who um, I, I just I put this here this panel because um, she sort of takes apart the tropes of the superhero genre. Not only is she queer, but she actually like wears a wig, um, which which I love. It's a great moment. She's not the first superhero to wear a wig, though. It's actually Spider Woman in 1978, but it's sort of fun. She she challenges the the sort of heteronormativity, the gender the gender identity roles of of the superhero comics, especially that old Batwoman character. She takes off her wig. Um, and if you remember, Batman had put her, put the old Batwoman up as a painting on the wall and she was sort of a figure to be looked at always. What's interesting is she sort of plays with that in her own comics. She becomes, she sort of directs the reader's gaze across the page. Um, this is a great panel from one of the early Batwoman comics. I think it's issue four of, of the Batwoman series where her cape becomes the place of the story and she uses the flashlight to direct the reader across the page. It's a, it's a, it's a really lovely series. It's one of my, it's one of my favorites for sure. Um, um, and she, this was a huge moment, not so much anymore, which is so funny, but it was a huge moment. She kisses her girlfriend um, in, and as I was mentioning, North Star, this is all mid early 2000s between like 2000, well, the early 2010s, um, North Star marries his boyfriend, we get a gay character in, in Archie Comics and Archie Comics finally stops sending their comics to the Comics Code Authority. They were actually the last company to stop doing so, but in 2011, they stopped sending their, their comics to the Comics Code Authority. Um, here's an example of another comic, Midnighter, which I was saying by Steve Orlando. Alters um, is a comic about a trans superhero um, who is able to live out their trans, their, 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 their identity um, and in, in their superhero and their, when they're a superhero. Um, Paul Levitz writes a story about their about um, Paul Levitz writes a story about his daughter, who came out. Um, plenty of queer characters started entering other comics. Doctor Afra in um, the, is a Star Wars character who's lesbian. Um, Lumberjanes does deals a lot with um, interesting expressions of gender and sexuality. Um, even characters like Harley Quinn um, and Catwoman and Poison Ivy really intriguing. Um, expressions of gender and, and Harley Quinn and Poison Ivy end up in a relationship together. It's a love, it's a lovely story. Um, all, the Wasp, the Ensemble Wasp, which is a great, which is one of my favorite comics in recent years, Jeremy Whitley writes it and they, it's a really cool um, group um, that, and most of the characters are queer in the story or sort of non-normative and interesting, queer in, in really interesting ways. Um, Catwoman comes out as bisexual and Wonder Woman is sort of finally identify, finally acknowledge that she has had um, relationships with women. Um, you, Snagglepuss even gets rewritten as gay, which is great. <laughs> and Mark Russell, it's a great story about Snagglepuss sort of being a Tennessee Williams type character. It's a, it's a really fun, it's very sad, but fun comic that sort of is a um, prequel to the Hanna-Barbera series. Um, 
And there's a great scene, Young Avengers, um, there's a great scene in Young Avengers that I like to show um, where <laughs> there's all these characters on here and everybody on the team is queer at this point, except for Hawkeye. And she says, am I the only person on the team who's straight? And America Chavez says, princess. <coughs> um, again, I'm just showing these ones as sort of examples. I can give you the names of these comics. I'm sort of just running through like sort of like, now there's such a proliferation. Um, Jughead comes out as asexual. Here's a moment where he talks about it. Um, in the series Sex Criminals, they explore asexuality. The character of Alex, A-L-I-X, is asexual. And so the story about sex criminals is that everybody, that there's a there's this narrative about orgasm in, <coughs> in sex criminals. Because this character is asexual, they explore really interesting ways as that sort of comes about for them. Um, America Chavez got her own series in the mid 2010s. <coughs> this is a really fun comic. Um, My Brother's Husband. Iceman is a really well known one. Um, Harley Quinn Breaking Glass. I'll just go. Oh, but um, another one that just came, this just came out today actually. Superman's son, um, John, um, actually comes out as, as, as queer. Um, I don't know if he's gay or bisexual, how he, how he, he identifies, but he ends up dating a man. And Tim Drake, the newest Robin, actually comes out as interested in, in this particular man. Um, there's a lot of wonderful YA stuff that's coming out right now. Laura Dean Keeps Breaking Up With Me is a great comic by Mariko Tamaki and Rosemary Valero O'Connell. Um, On a Sunbeam by Tilly Walden is imagining a world where there are only um, women and non-binary people. It's a beautiful comic. Um, Lots of online stuff is coming out that's really wonderful. The Pride. Um, if you're interested in more queer cartoonists, you can check out the Queer Cartoonist database. Flaming River Con was put on hold because of the pandemic, but it is a local like queer comic con. Um, okay, I ran through the rest of that. I'll see what the questions are. Hopefully I can I can fill in the gaps. I just wanted to run through that because we were way over time. Uh, all right, chat. <laughs> Thank you, Valentino. Um, I know there was one in the chat that was a question about trans representation. Um, I don't know specifically what time period they were asking about, but maybe more of the contemporary titles you were discussing. I think that's when it popped up. Yeah, so um, trans representation definitely, um, let me see if I can go back. Um, trans representation, um, Christine Smith's um, comic, The Princess. I didn't, I, I stopped, I just kept like going, um, but Christine Smith's series, The Princess, it's a great um, comic on trans representation. Um, let me go back, where was it? Um, Alters is a, is a, I don't know where it went. Alters is somewhere in here, which is a great one. Um, Gail Simone creates a character, Alyssa Yao, in um, in the Batgirl series. Um, another another representation of trans characters. I would say, admittedly, um, like the rest of the world, I think that comics are still catching up on trans representation. Um, there is a, a major trans character in the in the superhero TV show, um, though. Like as I said, Lumberjane sort of, sort of addresses it. I mean, there's more discussion. I think of like I, I gave you an example of a. Oh, there's altars. Um, this is a, uh, a, a really well-known, I think, super trans superhero character. Um, let me see if I can keep going. Where was the other one I was thinking of? Um, I, I, oh, right. Um, on a sunbeam depicts a lot of non-binary representation. They think, and so I think, um, Maya Kobabe is gender queer, not explicit. I don't think Maya Kobabe wouldn't say that they're they're trans, but I mean they're they're looking at gen at, at non-conforming gender identities. Um, there are a lot of stories, I think, but it's definitely the case that that is a um, that we're still sort of catching up with that. I would I would say I don't know that there that there's a lot. Um, oh, Jinx, yeah, Maya Kobabe. I mean, she's they are. Um, and I think they use actually use pronouns that are not they them, but they're they've identified some of their own pronouns that I am blanking on at the moment, but Maya, I'll just call it Maya, Maya, yeah, E and M, thank you. Um, so um, Maya, um, they, Maya E um, tells a great story in genderqueer. Um, so yeah, I mean, there's a lot of, um, yeah, I think, I mean, it, it's a fantastic series. I definitely recommend, I mean, not series, it's, a, it's one book, but I wish it were a series. <laughs> um, it's a, it's an, it's a great book, but um, 
I do think that that's something that needs to be explored. I think a lot of comic companies feel safe now representing um, like gay and lesbian identities. I think they're still working towards representing trans identities and non-binary identities. Um, yeah, Dreamer from Supergirl. I couldn't remember it's Dreamer's name, but I remember, yeah, like I said, there's a major trans character in Supergirl. Um, I think that that's something that a lot of companies are still trying to do. Like I said, Alyssa Yao is a main character, is a big character in, in the Batgirl series by Gail Simone, but um, there's still a lot of work to be done in, in, in that area for sure. Um, I think when we I think when we talk about queerness in comics, like we're still a lot of times talking about sexuality. Um, like, I mean, Maya Kobabe's work is so great, but I don't think we have a lot of um, autobiographical comics about trans identity not, I mean, not in the way that we have just, just, I mean, now I, I can't keep up with all the comics about like lesbian and gay identity, which would not have been the case 10 years ago. I mean, when Alison Bechtel's Fun Home came out, it was the only one. Now there's so, now there's so many and there's more coming out. Um, and I, so I think that there's, there's a lot still that's coming out and I think there's, and there's just an outpouring, which is fantastic. Um, and hopefully we, we will continue to see more of that. Um, for our purposes, like as I was saying, though, I think like the, the story that I wanted to tell is sort of that way in which, um, you know, the early period didn't hyper focus on queerness. It got really hyper focused in after the Wortham after the, after the Wortham um, he hearings. Um, it was sort of it was a major concern for comics companies. They wanted to make sure they didn't they didn't show it. Um, Underground Comics then took it up and said, okay, well we're going to do this. I mean, I'm sorry, I'm. I'm putting a narrative that I'm, I'm doing a short version of this. Um, and then we start to see a declaration of just lesbian and gay identity. By the 2000s, though, we start to see an exploration and deconstruction, as we did in, 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 in our world, too, like that there's more than just gay and lesbian identity, right? That there's all, and there's more than just, there's many gender identities, there's many sexualities that we have yet to even name. And I think comics are at that point now where they are there. There are so many, and they're not. They're not just trying to represent. Though I would say, DC and Marvel still are just trying to represent these characters. But I mean, a lot of comics are exploring um, the identity categories that had that had not been named before. That are not being that are given names now. That are um, and they're they're thinking about them. And so queerness again is 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 an open. It's just sort of this open concept again like it's just it's all over it's all over comics and we don't and what's not what's what's amazing is that it's I mean you have comics like Young Avengers where like all of the characters will be queer except for one which is typical like I was just not this is not untypical of you know queer friendships like sometimes you know the whole group will be queer um I remember I told that to someone once and they, they didn't understand that I was like okay because you're not <laughs> um but um I think that you know it's it's an amazing story of just how far we've come, but um, the the biggest the biggest problem was that moment in the 1950s where I mean we had such a focus on there was such a fear after Wortham's critiques that comics were so afraid to tell stories about about queer characters and that really limited um, what they were going to do for years. Not only about that, but he, he his work and the anti comics crusade is really limited um, comics. Unfortunately, I got another question. Um, when would I say the shift happened? Um, I would probably say, I mean, if I had to pick an exact period, if I had to pick an exact year, I would say 2006 with Fun Home. Like once Fun Home came out, then it was sort of like a floodgate, opened the floodgates. Um, I would say after 2010 though, um, because I think that culturally that's what we were, we were really starting to think of all identities. I mean, about queer identities after 2010. I mean, in, in popular culture, of course, I mean, people were thinking about it way before. I mean, queer theory as an academic discipline emerged in the 90s, right? But I think with the with the advent of queer theory in the 90s, with the discussion, with the reclaiming of queer in the 90s, and then it sort of made its way into comics um, by, I would say by the 2000s, um, that was the case that the people were exploring all kinds of identities. But after 2006, when comics, with Alison, what Alison Bechtel did, I know not everybody likes Fun Home. I love Fun Home, but I know not everybody does. But what Alison Bechtel did was what fun, what Mouse did for comics was that it showed that serious stories could be told in comics. And Bechtel showed that stories about sexuality and gender could be told in comics in long form and in very moving ways. 
And I would say that that just opened the floodgates and a lot of people cite Bechdel as their inspiration for being able to tell their stories um, and complex stories. Because if you haven't read Fun Home, um, she shows the complexity of, of sexuality for her and her father and, and, the, and, and how that plays out for each one of them. And I would say that that sort of really changed things for a lot of people. Um, and, and honestly, it showed the public, I, I mean, uh, it, it, we still live in, <laughs> in a world where, where money dominates, right? And it showed publishers that these books could sell. So more of them were around, more people were able to tell their stories. And I mean, I think that, I mean, that's, that's part of it too, but I would say probably up to 2006, but really, I think explicitly up to 2010. But it was a shift from lesbian and gay to queer. And I think a lot of, and we've witnessed that a lot in the last 10 years, the shift to, to, to queer. Um, like I said, as an academic discipline, queer theory emerges in the 90s. I would say it wasn't until the last 10 years though that it was a popular cultural sort of culturally acceptable way to talk. I mean, using the term queer, because I know a lot of um, LGBTQ people that, or LGBT people that still don't like the word queer. There, there is, that, you know, and I, I use it, I like it because I claim, I, I like to claim it, but I, I still talk to people that don't like to use the term. I would say even people my age sometimes are like, oh, why are you using that term uh, or that word? Um, but I would say that a lot of these comics are interested in thinking of queerness beyond, beyond the categorical lesbian and gay and thinking about sexuality beyond um, those, those limited definitions of how we can, and, and gender beyond limited definitions. And I like queer, especially because I think it allows us to think about gender and sexuality as, as just more complex categories that, and, and the overlap between the two and the ways that they overlap, the ways that they don't. Um, so I, I, like the, I like the term queer a lot, but I know that it's a, there's, it has a complicated and violent history and sometimes people don't like it. Okay, I rushed through a lot of <laughs> Are there other questions. <laughs> um, let's see. I know we're already over, but thank you so much for it. We, we made it through, you got, you got it in there. Um, was there something specifically that happened that made the anti-comics crusader so upset or paranoid? Or was it just the mere implication of challenging gender norms in superhero comics? Um, okay, yeah. So I, I, I know I didn't have a lot of time to talk about anti-comics crusades, but so the, the concern about gender and, and, say, and more importantly, sexuality for their concerns um, was a very, I would say a very minor concern, though it was of concern. Um, mostly it had to, there was a, there was the larger concern about what, what these anti-comics crusades were were identifying as juvenile delinquency. Um, the early 20th century um, was defined by, as I said, mental hygiene. Um, and so that mental hygiene sort of took up the concerns of, of adjustment and development in children um, prior to the 20th century, like that, the, the, what we think of now as like child development didn't, were not really um, codified or, or categorized in the way that we think of them now. And so there was a concern after the war, especially after the Second World War of juvenile delinquency, which most historians would now identify as a sort of anxiety that was created because we lived, I mean, post-war was sort of what um, W.H. Auden, the poet would refer to as the age of anxiety. And that sort of anxiety of the period after the war, after the dropping of the bomb would lead to a lot of juvenile delinquency. Um, people like Wortham though wanted to identify a reason for that delinquency. Uh, and so he saw a lot of kids reading comics. And so he, is, he, ident he said, well, it must be comics. It couldn't be sort of the, the fear of the dropping of the atomic bomb, the sort of the stories that were, that were coming out of Europe that were, not, that were told, but not yet sort of understood. Um, again, uh, so this is, this is an important point, but like it wasn't until 1955 with the publication of John Hersey's The Wall that, that we had a story about the Holocaust. Um, you know, now today we have many stories about the Holocaust and, and it's talked about, it's understood, but, but, but for many years after the war, there were, there were sort of just stories that were circulating and we knew about the atomic bomb. We, I mean, like, as if I were there, but <laughs> historically, right? Um, the, the, we knew about the atomic bomb. We knew about the, what was happening in Europe, but it wasn't very clear, especially to children. And there was a lot of concern about what was going on. And this was causing a lot of um, problems in, in children's behavior. Um, which would, which is totally 
normal. And as a psychotherapist, like I would say, yeah, kids are kids are afraid. They don't like in, in the way that climate change is causing and that is an existential threat though it's a real it's both real and, and existential it causes a, it, it obviously causes anxiety which leads to disrupt dis, disruptions um the anti-comics crusaders wanted to find out why and these were teachers they were librarians they were um and and they were mental mental health um, practitioners and they were on both sides there are men, carol tilly is a wonderful um scholar who has who writes a dissertation on the many 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 wonderful librarians that fought against the comics anti-comics crusaders so i don't mean to say all librarians did it but there are many librarians many bad mental i will say bad mental health practitioners many teachers that were working with children and thought well this is new these these this disruption is new these comics are new they must be linked to one another and one of the concerns was the was the problem of, of sexuality but that's because it was also a problem in the late 1940s and 1950s that there was a concern during the red scare of, uh, uh, most significantly about homosexuality and communism being linked to one another <laughs> and so that was and so there was a fear of of that being being um circulated through comics if that may, if, i hope that that helps so it was only one bit of a larger part but for the sake of our discussion it did lead to a major impact on comics especially the way the stories that um were, were going to be told about gender and sexuality um though it was not wortham's major concern um though he, it was of concern for him but he was concerned with a lot of things in his comics tons and he had he just goes he i mean he has a problem with every he, with everything <laughs> Thank you so much, Valentino. I obviously this is a huge topic that we could spend hours and hours talking about. So I appreciate everyone sticking around and you sticking around to kind of chat a little bit more. Um, Alex, do you have social media accounts where we can learn more? You do, I believe. I do. Um, so I think my my Instagram is is Valentino L Zulo, and I think my Twitter is Valentino Luca Z. If you just type in Valentino Zulo Instagram or um, or Twitter on on Google, you can you can find it. And I'm happy to talk more about this. I also teach at CIA. You can take a class. <laughs> um, but no, but honestly, if you want to do something, so I don't I, just to plug this on the first Thursday of every month um, through the Cleveland Public Library, we do book club discussions on comics at Brew House. I'm sorry, at Book House Brewery on West 25th Street. If you go to the Ohio Center for the Book page on the Cleveland Public Library website, if you just type in Ohio Center for the Book, you can see information about the book discussions. And I'm, and I'm happy to talk more about it there. Um, like, like, uh, like we were saying, I mean, it's a, like Nicole was saying, like, it's a big, it's a big topic. And I, I could talk about this for a semester. <laughs> Um, I did put your website in the chat, so oh, I think all your social media is leaked on there, as well as the information on the um, CPL book club, so check it out. Um, thank you so much again. This is such an important topic, and I think, like you said, um, there's such a spectrum of stories and experiences, and I just love that we have comic books and graphic novels to um, be the format to tell this um, experience in. It's just... Yeah. And there's so much amazing stuff coming out, um, you know, every month. I, I'm just, I'm always excited when we get our new graphic novels processed here. So, um, and many yeah. of these titles we do have at the library, um, or we can get them for you. Um, or if you have a Hoopla account, which is the digital streaming service um, through the library, you can read a lot of these um, on your couch without leaving your house. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Yeah. Read more comics. <laughs> Yes, thanks so much, everyone. Um, and we hope to have you back again, Valentino. Have a great night, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. See you later. Bye. Bye. -bye. <laughs>